Hello and welcome back to our continuing series of biblical studies recorded at Lamb's TV Studios. I'm your host, Chaplain R.T. Byram. The Apostle Paul was imprisoned in Ephesus in Asia Minor around 53-54 AD when he wrote to the Church of Corinth. And it had been about two years since his initial missionary visit to that city in Greece and his establishing there of a Christian community. You may remember from earlier programs that Corinth was a very commercial city at the crossroads of commerce and as such was influenced by many of the cultures and false religions. The inhabitants prior to Paul's establishing the Christian community indulged in the worship of idols, sexual immoralities, and many other vices. In the first nine chapters of Corinthians, Paul addressed a number of the problems that had entered the church. He always expressed his great love for them, but he also corrected them as a father corrects his children. We're going to open chapter 10, where the apostle reminds the new church of the warnings given them from the earliest times of Israel's history. So we're beginning in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now many of the words found in apostolic writings have deeper meanings than what may first appear translated to English. Notice the word ignorant in verse 1. In our language, that may appear to be almost an insult to a person's intelligence. In the Greek, however, it stood for unknowing or forgetting a fact. And notice that Paul is addressing this to brothers and sisters, presuming them that they had already entered in to be Christians. He reminded them that their ancestors came out of Egypt under the clouds by day and a pillar of fire by night, all provided as guidance by God. And then, He reminds them of the miracle of how they passed through the sea on dry land while the armies of Pharaoh that had pursued them for so many miles perished when the waters closed over them. Then Paul writes this strange sentence, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now what did he mean by that? We know that baptism is an outward sign of a worldly death and resurrection into a spiritual life. But there's even more to it. It's also a sign of submitting to obedience to God and His Son, Jesus Christ. So in a symbolic sense, passing through the sea under the cloud was also an agreement to be in submission under Moses as their worldly leader. Sadly, We saw how quickly that allegiance faded away. And the lesson is there for us today. Do we agree to submit to obey to follow Christ only to continually lapse into worldly pursuits? Well, praise God for the indwelling of His Holy Spirit who speaks to our conscience to continually turn us back to the narrow path. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 5. They all ate of the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. With all of that given to them, they continued to sin, and God responded by saying, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, if God took his plans that serious then, How much more today as we near the return of his son? Let's consider another word, the word ate, A-T-E in verse 3, where Paul wrote this, they all ate the same spiritual food. Now that word has an important meaning to us for the sustaining of our bodies. But these verses speak of spiritual food and spiritual drink. We remember in the wilderness the wandering Jews were fed with manna and were later given water to drink that flowed from a rock that Moses had struck with his staff. Yet Paul refers to the spiritual food that was the teaching their ancestors had received. 
to the water they drank came from the physical boulder at Mount Sinai, but Paul refers to the rock that was Christ that furnished them with living water that would satisfy their spiritual thirst. You know, when you consider the incredible sight and sound of God's presence on the holy mountain of Sinai, one could not imagine their soon returning to revelry and idolatry. But I want you to look again at verse 5 that said, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Two men who were spared come to mind, Joshua and Caleb, who obediently brought back a positive report about the promised land, which, if the 600,000 Jews and their families had accepted, would have pleased God and allowed them to enter the land. You know, with everything that happened to those ancient Jews, it makes you wonder if anything good can come of those early events. But just remember, God does everything for a purpose. Paul explains that in verses 6 through 10, which says this, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Just as Paul used the history of their people as examples, he also reminded them of the consequences of such behavior. When the worship of idols was listed, Paul's letter served as a painful reminder of the days in which the children of Israel made a golden calf to worship while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the commandments from God. And he didn't stop there, but he reminded them of their forefathers' actions at the very foot of the holy mountain, gluttony, drunkenness, and then he used the word revelry. Now in the Greek language, that describes playfulness. And you say, what's wrong with that, we might ask. Well, read on as the apostle describes their actions in specific terms and attaches the judgment that followed. Here's verse 8 again, if you'll remember. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Hard as that might be to believe, God's chosen people, the people of Israel, engaged in large numbers in sexual immorality with the daughters of Moab as part of the worship of Moab's God, including Baal. And in some cases, this is literal as sexual acts were sometimes used as part of the worship of false gods. It was true for Israel, and it was true in the worship of idols in Corinth. So once again, the Lord stepped in to discipline Israel for this sin. And before it was all over, 24,000 had been killed by another plague from the Lord. How God must sorrow at the incredible immorality in today's world it is no great stretch of imagination to picture HIV, AIDS, or even COVID-19 as modern versions of that plague. We'll look now at verses 9 and 10, which says this, We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. But don't test Christ, Paul writes. The idea of testing connotes a foreknowledge of right and wrong, and the very human tendency is to see just how far one can step over the line. Jesus warned Satan on the mountain of temptation, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And it's a warning to each of us as well. Don't test Christ. The ancient Jews were also grumblers. They complained about having to eat manna, of being short on water, of Moses spending too much time on Mount Sinai, about God trapping them between Pharaoh's army and the sea. But you know, God is a patient father. But there comes a time out, and in God's case, he sent a destroying angel to kill the grumblers. Temptations come in so many different packages. Time wasted before the TV set, wanting to get your money's worth at the buffet table, adding an extra five or ten miles of speed over the limit, 
detouring down the snack cake aisle when I've only come for salad at Walmart. And like Paul, this I keep on doing, but praise God for 1 Corinthians 10, verses 13 and 14. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I want you to think about that for a moment. Temptation in Hebrew is pyramus, meaning a putting to proof of an action or communication. And it may seem of little comfort to realize that you aren't the only one who has ever faced such a temptation or trial. But the great news for the faithful is that our all-powerful Father God will give us a way to overcome or endure. And like the agents, we must always be free from whatever our idols might be. Now Paul shifts gears and addresses the difference between idol feasts and the Lord's Supper. There were apparently questions raised about buying and eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. First, Paul reminds them of the purpose of the Lord's Supper in verses 15 and 16. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Paul's letters were read before the church, and it was made up of members both strong in the faith and others who were still growing in their belief. The latter lacked confidence in their freedom in Christ, and so the apostle addresses one of their concerns about eating certain cuts of meat. Notice how he credits them with being sensible and able to judge for themselves. Such a tribute served to perk up the ears to pay attention. Paul's rhetorical questions show that the congregation is well aware of the significance of the Lord's Supper. But there's an interesting addition to his statements found in verse 17. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. So having established the uniqueness of the true Lord's Supper, Paul compares the meat sacrificed to false gods or idols as opposed to animal sacrifices given to the true God of creation. Look at verses 18 to 22. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Was Paul speaking only of priests eating meat from sacrifices? There are five various types of sacrifices that are found in the first seven chapters of the book of Leviticus. One is a grain offering, and the rest are all animal sacrifices. A drink offering of wine was sometimes poured out on some feast days. And one of the perks of priestly duties in the temple was that the priests could consume the meat of most types of sacrifices. But after providing the requisite sacrifice, and after it was burned on the altar, families could eat the rest of the meat themselves. That was a type of bonding between God and humans in that he was pleased with the aroma from the altar for it represented atonement for sin. And the families who ate of the remainder of the animal they gave as a sacrifice were then fed and sustained by the same act. But there was a difference in the animals that were sacrificed to idols and bought on the open meat market. And Paul explains why in verses 19 to 22. He says, Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So is it okay to eat meat sacrificed to an idol since the idol is a false god and therefore meaningless? 
or is it wrong because it was offered to demons? And how do the answers to these questions apply to any of us today in the Christian community? Well, the only way you're going to find out is to return here for 1 Corinthians 10, part 2, coming soon your way. And please don't miss any of these messages and search this site for more messages on salvation, Christian living, the tribulation, the truth about hell, and many other valuable programs. Until then, the speaker and the staff of Through the Gathering Storm will continue to bring the truth of the living word to a dying world searching for answers. Oh, and remember to visit our podcast at throughthegatheringstorm.info, seen on the last title slide. I'm Chaplain R.T. Byron. May the Lord Jesus Christ give you an enjoyment and a blessed life in his care.